tribal trails The Son of God, He is near He chose to walk with us These tribal trails About 712 B.C., God called Isaiah to deliver a message to Israel. He said in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6, People are like the grass. Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in a field. The grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. It sounds so grim. Is there anything that we can count on for our eternal security? If that's what you're looking for, you've tuned in to the right channel. Welcome to Tribal Trails. My name is Bobby Iron. One of our guests today is Mervyn Chichu. In 2004, he gave a message from the book of 1 Timothy and Titus about the nature of God's Word. You know, we live in a world of uncertainty. Our minds just go back a few years to September 11, 2001. How our world was changed. We all got up like any other morning to wake up to the realization that our lives had been changed by the traumatic events that took place that shook our whole world. We think about uh, the disease just of, in the last couple of years that we've been battling and, and that we've been, been so concerned about uh, is known as SARS. And, and I know all of us are very concerned. And many died from that disease. We, were, we live in a world of uncertainty. Just a couple of summers ago, in Ontario, most of the province was hit by a power outage and some of the northern states. And about 50 million people were affected, and I was affected. And we were out of power, some for one day, two days, three days. And without power today, it, it changes your life. We've become so accustomed to the power and everything else that we have. The, and we uh, realize that uh, things can change so quickly. But you know, the scriptures tell us there are some things that are trustworthy, that are, that are true, that are reliable, that, you, that are worthy to, to be believed, that you can stake your whole life on these things. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, it says, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. That it's true and that it's reliable, it's dependable, it's worthy to be believed that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. This is talking about salvation. That Jesus Christ came and brought salvation. And Jesus Christ is able to save anyone who comes to him. I look back at my life. When Jesus Christ first came into my life. I was a teenager. I was living my own life, doing my own thing. That Jesus Christ came into my life and saved me. When he traveled the road to Mount Calvary. The painful task he came to do When he led them, nailed him to the cross It was his way of saying, I love you Salvation was his purpose our Lord would spend his lifetime through when he let them place the thorns on his head it was his way of saying I love you when he traveled the road to Mount Calvary to come the painful task he came to do When he led them, nailed him to the cross It was his way of saying, I love you 
Thank you, Bill and Shirley. The song echoes the truth in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, where the Apostle Paul said, God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is amazing. It moves our next guest, Keisha Cook, to share with her friends the great things that God has done in her life. Keisha starts her story from childhood. I spent most of my life in Sucker River, which is a little reserve, um, about 20 minutes north of Larange. I lived with my mom and my dad and two sisters. Um, my dad was a guide up at Hatchet Lake Fishing Resort, and so we'd go there every summer. That was definitely a highlight of my year. My mom and dad fought a bit because of the alcoholism, and like I thought very highly of both my parents and thought they were the best mom and dad, mom and dad in the world, despite you know um, drinking and fighting and things like that. Um, but I think my mom got sick of it. Um, and so when I was eight, my um, mom divorced my dad, and in the summer of 1999, my dad committed suicide, and that was probably the most difficult thing in, in my life. Um, I was nine at the time, and my world changed for the worst. Job said, When I looked for good, evil came to me. And when I waited for light, then came darkness. My heart is in turmoil and cannot rest. Days of affliction confront me. I was beginning to understand the despair um, just because my mom had turned to alcohol even more, so much so that she couldn't take care of us and had to give us up um, in, in, foster, in the foster care system. And I hated being away from, from my mom, and um, but I was really glad to have my sisters. Um, but then depression set in, and anger, and guilt, and shame, and all these things. And you know, we started to get into trouble. Um, and I tried a lot of things to kind of fill a void, and. Um, most of it just left, left me even more empty and angry and bitter and all those, all those things. Most of my family has struggled with suicide, including myself. Um, and I felt when I was 14 that I was ready to die. King David said, My heart is severely pained within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me and horror has overwhelmed me. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me." But that summer, God sent a missionary team from Colorado to my reserve. And, you know, I felt I was, like I was too cool to attend these, these, um, these B BBS things, but I heard that there was young, young people there, young guys, and I was wanting to check, check it out, so I went. <laughs> um, but I kept going, not for the reasons that I thought I was going to go initially, but because there was a kindness in, in, that I found in these people, and it was very appealing, and, and laughter and joy were things that I really, really wanted. So I kept going, and at the end of that week, um, a girl named Emily Singer led me to the Lord. And that was the happiest time of my life. Um, so I became Christian in June of 2004. And I gave up my, my old lifestyle and God gave me peace and joy and you know, um, love and, and laughter. And it was just the most amazing thing in the world. And I realized that you know, Jesus loved me and he died on the cross for my sins. And, and I've been following him ever since. What is involved in following Jesus? As far as the follower is concerned, he or she has to surrender. And surrender is not a very popular word because we use it in relation to making one feel ashamed or to lose respect for yourself, which comes from defeat. 
When a nation loses in a war, unconditional surrender may be imposed on her. However, the type of surrender that the Bible talks about is dignified and appropriate. Believers can understand it in two ways. First, it means giving our desires and wills to God, the Heavenly Father. Our Lord Jesus has set a good example for us. The Bible tells us that He did the Father's will in everything. The second aspect is our submission to God's sovereignty. That happens when we've come to the realization that things don't always go our way as God works out His will on earth. Our businesses may go through bad times, our health may suffer, loved ones will hurt us, or leave us, or even die. In difficult circumstances like these, surrender means that we trust God to do what is best. Therefore, the Apostle Paul chose to be content in any situation, knowing that God would take care of his needs. That kind of faith isn't easy, but as we trust Christ, he'll help us to handle the uncontrollable situations. If you'd like to talk to someone about what you've been going through, call us. We count it as a blessing to walk with you on your journey of faith. Within the halls of Pilate, compassion was the tone of voice he used. When he let them put the stripes on his back, it was his way. Say, I love you. When he traveled the road to Mount Calvary to complete the painful task he came to do. When he led them nail him to the cross, it was his way. The second one that we find is in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 9 and 10. It says again that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. And to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. This is talking about a security in salvation that when Jesus Christ comes into your life, he completely saves you. It says in John chapter 10, verse 27 to 30, he said, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. It's dependable, it's worthy to be believed that once you give your life to Jesus, He is able to save you as Hebrews 7 and verse 25 says, to the uttermost, He's able to save you completely and eternally. The moment I became a Christian, uh, I quit doing the things I had done before. And it was really interesting because I had a really tight group of friends. There's about, I think there's, yeah, there's five of us. I told them I'd become a Christian, and, and one of them jokingly said, you know, we'll give you a couple of weeks to smarten up and, and become normal, whatever that meant. But I knew, I knew deep down that that was not the life that I wanted to live. Um, and a couple of weeks passed by, and I started to see my friends less and less, and that was almost as hard as losing my dad, you know, because... You have people who have loved you unconditionally and, and then they, they decide that you're too different or, or too weird. You know, you're, you're changing. And, and so it was really hard to accept the fact that they were letting go of me. Um, but I knew that if I wanted to continue this relationship with God, I needed to let go of that old lifestyle. This is a lifelong, lifelong commitment and um, all these... Um, struggles and um, are worth it like so I had my my friends from from Colorado and the people that God had placed in my life um, help me stay strong and and keep teaching me about the Word of God and 
and my friend Emily, um, she would, you know, write me letters and asking me to read a chapter and tell her what I loved about it the most. And um, that really inspired in me a love for the word. And um, yeah, in church, it it was really amazing to get together with other fellow believers and and to encourage each other in the Lord and to sing songs together, praising God and and you know sharing um, our joys and our sorrows together. And, The third one we find is in the book of Titus, chapter 3, and verses, verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. And here the third thing we find here that's dependable, that's trustworthy, that's true, that's worthy to be believed, is that uh, you and I are to do good works and that it's profitable for men. And you know, if there's anyone that should be doing good, it should be God's people. You know, the New Testament church were known to do good works. They tell us about the New Testament church that oftentimes those the government would put on the streets those who were lame and crippled and who were maimed. And they tell us that they put them there because they knew that the church would come and gather these people up and bring them into the church and take care of them. You know, back in those days of the New Testament times, they didn't have abortion clinics like we have to do. And what used to, the woman used to do if they didn't want their children is that they would take them to the dump. Again, they, the reason why they did that was because they knew that the Christians would follow them to those dumps and come and gather the children and bring them into the church and take care of these children and bring them up in the church. If there's anyone that should be known for doing good works, it should be those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. I became a Christian in 2004, and that winter, 2004-2005, um, a mission team from Bethany College, which is in Hepburn, came to my community and they had um, daily vacation Bible school during the Christmas holidays and, and told us who they were and, and um, uh, told me about this Bible college and I thought it was really exciting that they could devote, you know, um, all their time and, and stuff into studying God's Word and, and um, growing as believers and, and ever since I met that first team I was, I was pretty much convinced that I was going to Bethany College when I graduated. What are some of the lessons that God has been teaching you either through um, 
classes or through just life at, at college? Um, it seems like each year has been different and you know, I can talk for hours about all the things that I've learned at Bible College. Um, this year one of the things that really sticks out to me is um, how God gave me an excitement about being an Aboriginal person. I, my, each third year goes on an overseas missions trip and this year we got to go to Paraguay, <clears throat> which is a really amazing experience. And we did a lot of church services um, to the Aboriginal peoples in Paraguay. And I was super excited to say, you know, that I'm an Aboriginal person from Canada and I felt celebrated as an Aboriginal person, like <clears throat> um, once they, they understood who I was and like they were very welcoming and I was really excited to, to know that they wanted to communicate with me and because growing up I actually used to be ashamed of being Aboriginal just because of um, stereotypes. And yeah, stereotypes. Like, um, like being followed around in the school, in, in the store, thinking that, or because they like thought I was stealing, or just alcoholism and suicide and and vandalism and all these things, and I was ashamed of being associated with that. With that, and so God gave me a lot of healing in that area um, this past year at Bible College, um, which is really exciting. Definitely, the experience in Paraguay helped a lot with that. Just um, being treated like a celebrity pretty much actually because they had cell phones and like they were taking my picture and usually they're very reserved people um these aboriginal peoples that we met in paraguay and and just to hear like you know them speaking to me in their language and and knowing that they thought there might be a, a connection between the two of us because they're aboriginal peoples that was that was um a really really neat learning experience Close to you, never let me go. Lay down again. If you say that I'm free, you are my desire. It's been seven years now and I've seen like, God work in really, really amazing ways and He saved me from a destructive lifestyle and a life of, of despair and depression and suicide and, and yeah, and He's the reason I'm here today and attending Bible College and, and yeah, I really hope that God would be able to use me as an instrument of, of you know his grace and, and peace and love and I'm hoping to like get my Bachelor of Arts at Bethany College and Pastoral Ministries um, and I was hoping to go into social work um, just to work with my people but whatever I do I hope that um, I'd be able to encourage people in the Lord and 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 watch people as they grow to love him yeah that it's true and that it's trustworthy, it's reliable, it's dependable, it's worthy to be believed that, uh, that you and I can serve the Lord. That you and I as Aboriginal people, we can serve God. We can be fruitful in serving God. 
that we can do a great work for him. And my challenge to you today is to find out what God wants you to do. And then to go and to serve him with all your might. Because one who desires to serve the Lord, it says desires a good work. And so we live in a world that has a lot of uncertainties. But the Bible tells us that there are certainties, there are things that we can stake our lives on in the scripture. And my challenge to you this morning in closing is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And it's a faithful saying. It's true, it's dependable, it's worthy to be believed. And there's maybe some of you who are listening today that need to stake your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. I challenge you to give your life to him and to come to Jesus today. Perhaps God is speaking to you today about your relationship with him. He might have asked you to trust him and let him work in and through your life as he did with our guests. For this to happen, you need to respond to God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son Jesus. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for our sins. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And Lord, I pray that you would come into my life. I give my life to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm glad that you've prayed and that you have put your trust in Jesus. But that's not the end of it. You need to grow in your Christian faith. So give us a call. We'd like to get in touch with you and encourage you to know more about the Lord. In Jeremiah 31, verse 3, the Lord said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. He left the splendor of heaven Knowing his destiny Was the Lord Heavens, amen.